Okay, um, on the agenda today, we need to review chapters one, two, and three uh, for an exam that's due a week from today, Friday. As far as that exam goes, it's, it's delivered in the format of Blackboard, but you can only access it through Lockdown Browser. So go to your syllabus and it'll explain to you how to load Lockdown Browser. You have to get it from a specific website and the link is in there. And then in Blackboard, you'll also find a practice test for Lockdown Browser so that you know that all your equipment works before you're in the middle of the exam. You want to be sure everything works before you even start the exam. The practice test is it's just one question and it doesn't matter what your answer is because it's not graded anyway. <clears throat> So that's how you access. Now, what can you have with you during the, during the exam? You can have a calculator. Um, and if something happens to your calculator during the exam, um, there's also a built-in scientific calculator in Lockdown Browser that I've enabled. So you don't have to panic. If, you, if your batteries go dead or something like that, then you've always got that scientific calculator right there in Lockdown Browser. Uh, let's see. Oh, what else you can have with you? You can have a periodic table. Um, I would suggest the one that, that I gave you for learning the symbols. The ones that, uh, let's see, let me share it. I think I've got it pulled up over here. Uh, that's not it. Let's try this one. And that's not it. I need to go to um, no. Okay, ah, here it is. The one that says know these symbols under exam one. You can, uh, I would print it out because you may not have access to that once you go into Lockdown Browser. Um, it, the exam will be right here in this folder, but you have to do Lockdown Browser before you open Blackboard and go down and there's your exam. Just click on it, start it. Once you're inside the Lockdown. But before you do that, I would uh, print this out. See, there's your, there it is. There's your periodic table. You can have that with you during the exam. In fact, you will need it. Okay. Um, so any questions about the, the exam? That's, it should be open now. Let me check to see. I've got it on adaptive release. And, oh, okay. The adaptive release for the exam. You won't be able to see the exam unless you have taken the syllabus knowledge test and gotten a grade for it. Okay. Uh, all you have to do is look at your grade book and you'll see the syllabus knowledge check and there'll be a grade there. If you've got that, then you'll have access to the exam. But if you haven't taken that syllabus test, then you won't have access to the exam. Okay, let's go back. Uh, this is a good way as any. All right. Um, and just a reminder, you do have this extra credit that's available between now and the exam um, is open date. So you can submit that and you just go right in here. And there's the document. And you just right click it and save that link on your computer and then follow the instructions and complete the uh, periodic table and you get extra credit for it. And then when you get finished with it, of course, uh, you'll have to do it by hand and then photograph it or scan it and then you attach it right here. 
and then down in the lower right hand corner which my stuff is covered up there's a submit button right there okay so I, I think that's that's all as far as business goes and then of course um, you should have already worked all the problems that I put in your homework and that's what we're going to do today we're just going to we're going to fly through those homework problems um, that are listed out here let's see learning modules there it is so we're going to go through these problems I know there's a lot of them but they they're really quick answers for most of them and I'll try not to be too windy so that we can get finished on time because we've got three chapters to go through in two hours which is a really tall order so we better get started all right let me unshare this and share the uh, first chapter questions i've scanned them out of my textbook so that we can use them as a reference let's see share uh do this one there we go everybody see that changes in matter chemical symbols so forth and then i need to let's see well let me yeah scroll down and this is where the homework questions start these are at the end of the chapter chapter in your textbook <clears throat> and i've uh, i boxed off the ones red boxes on the ones that were indicated in your homework so these should not be unfamiliar to you in fact before i even get started uh, i want to open the floor for questions on specific uh, problems let's do it chapter by chapter so if you have a question in chapter one um, make it known now so that we can get your concerns out of the way before i just start uh, rambling on And I'll check my role again while you guys are thinking. There we go. Well, while I'm here, why don't I just check? Um, syllabus test. I only have one student that hadn't done a syllabus test yet. Uh, Haley, you need to get that done because if you don't have a grade on your syllabus test, you will not have access to the exam. Um, we can talk about it later if you have uh, problems. We'll not use up uh, class time for that right now. Let's see, somebody else showed up. Uh, all right. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, these first questions are, are really simple. Um, in fact, they're so simple. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to use my. I wonder what this one does. No, I don't want to use that. Let's let's do this one. Let's just draw. Okay. What are the two general characteristics that all types of matter possess? It's not a trick question. In fact, I learned this one in grade school. What is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. Okay, just that simple. Oh, I see what this is going to do. Okay, there we go. Classify each of the following as matter or energy. All right, so the universe is is composed of two things: the matter that we just described. Everything else is energy. Um, so. Air is matter, right? It has mass, occupies space. Sound, no, sound is energy. Sound travels through matter, and it uses matter, but it isn't matter. Sound is energy. Uh, pizza is matter. <laughs> Gold is matter. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to look in, uh, dig into the difference between. Let's see. Uh, well, they call it physical characteristics. 
we would identify it as physical properties. Uh, so let's stick with their terminology for now. Liquids, how do you distinguish a liquid from a solid? Right. Solid can hold its shape, right? And liquids have no shape. How about volume? I'm writing a little too small. I'll write bigger next. Definite volume. Liquids, definite volume. So the difference is between liquids and solid is shape. <clears throat> a liquid needs a vessel. Now, why is that? Well, the molecules in a solid are locked in place against their neighbors. They, they might vibrate, right? but they're not going to move. Whereas in a liquid, the forces holding those molecules together are just weak enough to let them slide past. They interact, but they, they free to slide around one another. And since they can do that, there's nothing holding them in a position, which means they have no shape. Uh, the, the gross collection of liquid has no shape, so it needs a vessel. How do we distinguish gases from liquids? Well, gases definitely have no shape. <laughs> they have no volume either. They have no volume of their own. And the difference between a, a liquid and a gas is like a solid and a liquid, only to the extreme. Because gases, the molecules in a gas, are very far apart. In fact, gases can be treated as if the molecules don't exist. And an ideal gas could be cooled and compressed down to nothing to zero volume and never phase change. Now that's, of course, that's ideal and we know it doesn't happen, but the, under certain conditions, gases behave as if they're ideal. Now, what are those conditions? I might as well mention it now, stream of consciousness. Ideal gases behave, real gases behave ideally if the temperature is high and pressure is low. Under those conditions, you can treat real gases as if they were ideal. Oh, skip the page. Let's go back up and see, okay, come down here. Properties of matter. Okay, let's see, I'm gonna have to uh, minimize some stuff here and maybe move. Okay, I'll try to, I'll just shift this stuff around so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, 1-9, uh, classify each of the following properties of the metal magnesium as a physical property or a chemical property. Okay, now we're looking at the difference between Let me erase this a minute. They'll cooperate. Um, oh, my mind's gone blank. Shoot. Well, we'll focus on properties first. So a physical property uh, talks about a substance in terms of no change occurring to that substance. And it just describes the substance. It's more like a state function. So example, for magnesium, solid at room temperature. That would be a physical property. It just is solid. Doesn't say anything about possible changes. Doesn't say anything about possible physical changes or chemical changes. It just is a solid. That's a physical property. 
ignites upon heating in air. That describes a chemical property because we know that under the right conditions, magnesium will burn. In fact, when I was a kid, we still used film cameras. None of this uh, LCD stuff, electronic cameras. It was all on film. And in fact, if the light were too low, you couldn't get a good picture. So they had what they call flash bulbs. And they stick these flash bulbs in your camera and use once and throw away. That was, they were good for one shot and that was it. What they had inside them was this, looked like a steel wool. It's very, very fine filaments. And inside was the filaments composed of magnesium and then air or maybe even pure oxygen, something inside there, so that it would react if ignited. And the flash would be a, a, a jump of spark in that mass, and it would flash, and that would add light to your picture. So it ignites upon heating and air. That's true, it's a chemical property. It doesn't say what happens in the process of that burning. That would be a chemical change. But the chemical property is the tendency toward ignition if the conditions are right. How about hydrogen gas is produced when it is dissolved in acids? When, when what is dissolved? Well, we're talking about magnesium, right? When magnesium is dissolved in acid, it produces hydrogen gas. That is a... Um, chemical property. You know, actually, that's a chemical change. I think the authors missed it on that one. It describes a tendency for magnesium to dissolve in acids and produce hydrogen gas. That description would be a chemical property, but that sentence tells me that's a chemical change. Uh, it has a density of 1.738 grams per cubic centimeter at 20 degrees C. That's a physical property that simply describes something about magnesium that has nothing to do with any uh, change in its identity. It's still magnesium. Okay, as always, you stop me if you need to. Okay, let's go to one, one three, one thirteen, and I'm watching my clock. Uh, classify each of the following observations about the behavior of a substance as a physical property or chemical property. Uh, I'm going to skip this because uh, we're short on time, and we've hammered the properties, chemical properties, and physical properties. If we get to one that talks about changing, then we'll stop and talk about that one. See, classify each of the following as physical property, physical change, chemical pro. Okay, here's a good one. So you got each of these possibilities. Is it a property or a change first? And then is it physical or chemical? Let's see who showed up. Um, let's see, I minimized. Let me see where it is. No, that's not it. Who showed up? Uh, oh, Paul. Right. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So let's look at these and see the process of burning a piece of newspaper. Okay. If it just says that's potential, well, it actually says that there is a change going on. Let me see what the authors claim. All right, so if we're describing something as burning, that is a change, and it's a chemical change that's taking place. The fact that metallic copper reacts with chlorine gas is just saying it has the potential to react, so that's a chemical property. Um, C, uh, the process of melting ice. 
if ice is actually melting, that's a physical change. It's changing, water is changing from solid to liquid. It's not changing its identity. It's still water. So it's a physical change. The fact that metallic gold is a solid at room temperature, that's gotta be a physical property. And let's see, yes. Okay. Um, some of these are, are redundant because I wanted you to have plenty of practice. 117s. No, we're not going to stop there. Uh, okay, let's get into mixtures. Talk about mixtures. Right, a mixture is composed of two or more substances. Actually, in order to define a mixture, we need to know that they are two or more pure substances. So what is a pure substance? It could be an element. It could be a compound. <clears throat> but it has its own identity. That's the key. So hydrogen gas is a, an element that is a pure substance. Uh, water, as long as it has nothing else in it, is a pure substance. Now, what, how can they mix? They can make, you can make a mixture that is either heterogeneous or homogeneous. Okay, so what's the difference? Well, it, whenever possible, look at the words. Hetero means other, the prefix that means other. It implies the fact that the mixture is not uniform. In other words, uh, if you take a sample from different parts of the mixture, you're gonna get a different composition, a different ratio of the pure substances that are com contained in that mixture. Whereas if it's homogeneous, no matter where you sample, you will always have the same ratio of the pure substances. Okay. <clears throat> uh, there's another name for homogeneous mixtures. You remember that one? That's a solution. Now, there's some argument that... Um, Actually, there's one class that's not really a solution. It's called a colloid. But we're not going to hammer that one right now. For all intents and purposes, homogeneous mixtures are solutions. Um, what type of pure substance, two pure substances, can you put together and always get a solution every time? Two gases. If you mix gases together, they will always form a homogeneous mixture. Okay, so let's look at these examples <clears throat> and define them as heterogeneous mixture, homogeneous mixture, or pure substance. Okay, two substances present. Okay, so that can't be a pure substance if you got two of them. Um, so it's a mixture. What kind of mixture? Two phases are present. If you've got two phases, that means that you cannot have a homogeneous mixture. It's heterogeneous. What do we mean by two phases? Uh, for example, if you mix sand and water, the sand is still solid. And in fact, unless you're stirring it real fast, as soon as you stop stirring it, sand's gonna start to settle. And that means you have uneven distribution. 
that's heterogeneous. Two substances, two phases, heterogeneous. Two substances present in one phase is homogeneous. For example, if you put a uh, table salt in water and mix it, eventually the solid disappears and now you only have liquid. That's a homogeneous mixture. <clears throat> One substance present and one substance present and two phases. Oh, okay, okay. Um, actually, you don't have a mixture there. If it's one substance like um, water and two phases, that means it's either a gas and a liquid or a liquid and a solid, or it could be all three under the right conditions. But we're saying two phases, okay? So we're, we're restricting ourselves. Uh, you could also have a solid and gas. It's possible under the right conditions to cause ice to sublimate. And that goes straight from solid to gas. Um, water's not a good example. Carbon dioxide, dry ice is a better example. You could have a solid and a gas together. Uh, you've got one substance present, but it's in two different phases. Okay, <clears throat> D, three substances are present. Three phases are present. Uh, I would expect that one to be a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, see if we can give that horse a rest and look for something else. And of course I'm going to run out of time. That's par for the course. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, let's, let's do number 29. We're starting to, to delve into the definition of compounds now. And we may as well talk about it uh, right after this one. So let's do 29. From the information given, classify each of the pure substances, A through D, as elements or compounds, or indicate that no such classification is possible because of insufficient information. Okay, so we do have to uh, define element and compound. An element is a pure substance, but it's composed of only one kind of substance, and, I, I, and that's not a good term. It's composed of one type of atom. An element is the uh, purest you can get by both physical and chemical means. So if you just use physical means, then you could also have a compound. Well, you know, you could have an element too. Um, for instance, an element can either be uh, monatomic, right, one atom. It could be diatomic, like hydrogen gas. Remember those that I identified in that periodic table with uh, blue backgrounds? There were just a few of them. Um, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen fluorine, chlorine, bromine. Those are all diatomic gases, right? They're still elements, right? Because there's only one type of atom there, but they're diatomic. I didn't mention other types of, of uh, call them allotropes, different forms of elements, but this is possibility. You have four phosphorus atoms linked together. 
that's still an element, but you have four atoms in the molecule. Right? So that's a molecule. That's an atom. That's a molecule. There are two atoms together. That's a molecule. Or we could do this one. We could have eight sulfurs bound together. Those are all elements because there's only one type of atom. But they could be atomic, monatomic, diatomic, tetraatomic, octaatomic. So what's a compound? A compound has to have two or more elements. So we could take um, we could take these two, hydrogen and sulfur. bound them together and make a compound. Okay, that's, that's also a molecule because it behaves as a single unit. It doesn't break apart um, unless you force it to. The bonds are internal, hold it against any attack from the outside. Uh, as opposed to, say, this, Sodium chloride, well, I'm, I'm using a name, we haven't named compounds yet, <clears throat> but this is an ionic compound. In other words, under certain circumstances, that sodium can be stripped away from the chlorine. So this is molecular because it, it, you have to break covalent bonds, but this is ionic. So they're, they're both compounds, that's true, but that one's molecular and this one's ionic. And we'll get into that more in the future. But a compound has to have two or more different elements. All of these can have more than one atom, but they're not compounds. Okay, so now with that definition, let's look at uh, A through D. Let's see, analysis with an elaborate instrument indicates that substance A contains two elements. That is a compound. It has two or more elements that are bound together in this substance. A substance B decom decomposes upon heating. Okay. Um, that's a little more cryptic, right? What do we mean by decomposes? When something decomposes, there's a chemical change. It breaks apart into uh, one or more elements. So that's considered to be a compound. Uh, C, heating substance C to 1,000 degrees causes no change. So that would be <clears throat> impossible to classify, <laughs> actually. Right, because it could be, um, it could be an element that, um, say, it's a solid element. Just for example, and you heat it to a thousand degrees, and it's still a solid. That just means you haven't reached the the melting point. But we don't know if it's an element or a compound. There's no way to tell. Uh, if you eat heat substance D to five hundred causes it to change from a liquid, from a solid to a liquid. And that one um, is also not possible, right? Because some elements have melting points that high. Some compounds have melting points that high. So we can't tell the difference for C and D, whether it's a, uh, an element or a compound. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, okay, we've talked about those enough. All right. So let's see. Uh, okay, here we go. Now we're going to look at chemical symbols. Right. Um, that was 
your very first task in this course was to memorize some of the symbols, about half of them. If you haven't memorized all the symbols that I told you to, then you have my sympathies because the rest of the semester is going to be hard. <clears throat> Names and chemical symbols. So here's some examples. We'll just run down these, <clears throat> all of these, even though they're not all in red. So what's N? N is nitrogen. N has claimed sole possession of the single letter N. So anything else that wants N in its symbol has to add an extra letter. And the next one does. NI is nickel. Now, if I write that, if I write uh, nitrogen this way, it's wrong. That's not nitrogen. That's nitrogen. If I write nickel this way, that's not nickel. Nickel is this. The second letter is always small. This would be something like uh, nitrogen iodide. That would be a compound. I don't even know if that exists. So if you write or type a symbol uh, with any of those mistakes in it, it's wrong. It doesn't matter how right the rest of it, your answer is. If the symbol's wrong, the answer's wrong. <clears throat> PB, what does PB stand for? That's one of those that's derived from the Latin. <clears throat> it's not derived from the English <clears throat> or anglicized name. PB is derived from the Latin plumbum, which means lead. Well, actually, in Latin, it means heavy, but it's applied to the element lead. PB is lead. SN, there's another one, derived from the Latin, stanum, for tin. How about LI? LI is a little easier. LI is lithium. HE, uh, had to take an extra letter because hydrogen already had claim to the single letter H. H E is helium. By the way, we know that we, we can put helium in balloons, make them float, and carry large masses into the atmosphere. But where was helium first discovered? Right? Helium was not one of those that was brought forward by the ancients. A lot of the elements were known to the alchemists and modern chemistry just uh, accepted that and gave them letters and usually accepted the name as they were given. But helium was a modern discovery. It was discovered on the sun spectroscopically. Helium was identified in the atmosphere of the sun before it was discovered on Earth. Now, where can you find a concentration of helium on Earth? You won't find it in the atmosphere. It's too light. It just tends to move to the top of the atmosphere and it's gone out in space. <clears throat> You'll find helium trapped underground. And the most readily available source is natural gas. So when, when oil companies, gas companies, pull natural gas out of the ground, the process of cleaning it up for usage, they'll remove all the moisture. It'll have some moisture in it, but it'll also have a, a high concentration, relatively speaking, of helium. So they extract the helium and they pump it back down underground into our reserves. They have uh, hollowed out salt mines underground and that's where they store the helium. 
In fact, helium used to be considered a strategic element. Back around before World War I, um, it was a strategic element because the Germans had those big Zeppelins and they could drop bombs with them. So we said, okay, no more helium. Germany, the spigot is cut off. You can't have helium for your balloons. So Germany went to using hydrogen, which is more efficient, but it's also flammable. And uh, uh, there were several fires before the Hindenburg, but the Hindenburg was the straw that broke the camel's back. And after that, uh, airships just went, pfft, no more airships. Nobody would fly on them. Okay, that's enough of that. <clears throat> what are the, the chemical symbol for aluminum? That's A-L. How about neon? That's N-E. So we got A-L. We got N-E. Okay. Uh, how about hydrogen? Well, I already mentioned that one. The chemical symbol is, hydro is H. But that's not the way hydrogen occurs in nature, right? Hydrogen occurs as a diatomic, but the symbol is an H. So just an H would answer the question. How about uranium? I wanted you to memorize that one too for its historical significance. It's just a capital U, right? That's the one that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945. How about mercury? Now there's one, doesn't start with an M. <laughs> Mercury is HG for hydrogenium. Um, alchemists and early modern scientists were using mercury and they found that under certain conditions, they could make compounds with mercury and then react it and produce water. So they said, okay, mercury is responsible for this. So we'll say, uh, hydrogenium, genium means uh, create, so it's water creating. But now we know mercury is a metal, and in fact, it's the uh, it's the only metal that's liquid at room temperature. There's one that's really close, right? gallium, GA. It has a melting point in the neighborhood of uh, about 30 degrees, something like that. So maybe in a hot room, it would turn. <laughs> but in your hand, it'll melt readily, right? What's your body temperature in, in Celsius? 37 degrees Celsius. That's equal to 98.6. Okay. Uh, mercury, we got that one. Chlorine. Right? Chlorine's not C for carbon. It's already taken. CL, capital C, little l, chlorine. Gold. Gold is one of those that's derived from the Latin, aurum, AU. And beryllium. Uh, beryllium is BE. So that one's easy. Um, let's see. Okay, 153. How about sodium? How do you write sodium? Sodium is not S-O. <laughs> sodium is N-A. For natrum, the Latin for sodium. Sulfur is just S. Magnesium. Magnesium is M, capital M, little g. Manganese, capital M, little n. Calcium, Ca, that's an easy one. Cadmium, right? Ca is already taken, so we can't say, we can't use Ca for cadmium. We have to go to the next letter, which is common. Cd is cadmium. How about arsenic? Well, logic would say Ar, right? But Ar is already taken. AR is argon. So arsenic is AS. By the way, where's the most abundant source of argon on Earth? It's 
in the atmosphere. It's a little less than 1%. That's a lot of argon that's available. All you have to do is liquefy air, liquefy air and then distill it. And you get argon easy. Uh, okay, so, okay. Let's see if, if any of these, how about potassium? Potassium is one of those Latin derived. It's K for calium. How about phosphorus? It's not pH, it's just P. Phosphorus gets to use one letter. Iron, there's another one. Ferrum, F-E. Iodine is a single letter, I. How about silicon? Well, sulfur's already taken S. So S-I is silicon. How about silver? Silver's not S. I or SL or SV or any of those. Silver is AG, Latin Argentum. Okay, so let's see. Now let's, let's shift gears. I'm taking way too much time. So here's what's going to happen. Um, when, uh, let's see. Yeah, just checking. When 11 o'clock rolls around, technically, I mean, if we were face to face, um, we may not have a lab on a day like this. So I would just use lab time to finish the discussion. But under these circumstances, uh, if you've got to be someplace else at 11 o'clock, you can go. And I'll just keep going because this discussion needs to continue until it's done. Chapters one, two, and three, all three of them need to be covered. So I'm gonna do that today. Um, and the recording then will be made available very shortly. In fact, I've made modifications in my uh, equipment that allows me to process these videos a lot faster. So I, I expect uh, by this evening, I'll have the video available for you in Blackboard. Okay, back to the topics. Uh, classify the substances represented by the following molecules as homoatomic or heteroatomic. So what do we mean by that? Well, remember the prefixes. Homo means same. Same atom. Hetero means other. Other atom. So the ones that are homoatomic have the same atoms. And the way they're illustrated, C, this with two red bulbs, that's the only one that's homoatomic. The rest are heteroatomic. All right. More examples. Um, you've got these A, C, and D are all heteroatomic. And B is homoatomic. You know what that looks like to me? That looks like ozone. You've got three oxygen molecule uh, atoms here. And this double one up here looks like uh, normal oxygen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we've still got the same root word, atomic. But now we're going to say, how many atoms are there in the molecule? Okay. So diatomic would be two. Right, we look back up to our example. This one right here would be diatomic. Triatomic. Triatomic would be this one that I think is ozone. How about tetraatomic? Tetraatomic would be four atoms in the molecule. This one would be four right here. That one looks to me like, uh, let's see, two oxygens. These are probably hydrogens. That would be um, hydrogen peroxide. Okay. What would this one be right here. This one's probably methane. You've got one in the middle and four around it, so it'd be pentaatomic. Right? Remember your prefixes from when we were talking about units of measure, pentaatomic. And this one would be one, two, three, four, five, six. It would be hexaatomic. 
Okay, so just go on up, however many you need. Uh, let's see. That's a, I'm gonna skip a little bit here. Let's see, what's this one about? Select the diagram or diagrams that represent each of the listed situations. There may be more than one correct answer for a given situation. Okay. Which diagrams represent a compound whose molecules are triatomic? Let's see, there's some triatomics. So Roman numeral one, uh, none in there. Oh, there's some triatomics and there's some triatomics. All right, so we've got uh, one, three, and four. Which diagram represents a mixture of two compounds? Okay, so we need compounds, right? It, sometimes when you answer a question, it's good to read it backwards, right? It's got to be compounds or the, it doesn't answer the question. So which ones have compounds? Four's out. Those are all the same atom, right? That's not a compound. Uh, let's see. Three, two, one. Those are all compounds. Right, so now we can go move back through the question and say a uh, mixture of two compounds. So we need two compounds in this mixture. So let's, let's one, that's no, Roman numeral one only has one compound in it. It's not a mixture. Uh, two is a mixture of compound and element. So that can't be, right? Because you've got these two oxygen atoms, I think. So three does have uh, two different types of molecules in there. Yep, Roman numeral three will answer B. How about C? Which diagram represents a mixture that contains two different types of diatomic molecules? Okay, so they have to be molecules, but they don't have to be compounds two different types of diatomics, okay? So they have to have two atoms hooked together as molecules. Uh, that doesn't work, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Two's the only one. So that's a diatomic and that's a diatomic, but they're two different types. One's an element, one's a compound. Um, let's see, have I missed anybody? Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm just checking my roll again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I think I got everybody covered. Okay, let me back to the question. Which diagram represents a pure substance? Okay, remember, a pure substance can be an element or a compound. So here, there's only one type of compound in there. That's a pure substance, and we got one. Uh, that's not pure, it's a mixture. That's not pure, it's a mixture. That's a pure element. So one and four are pure substances. Okay, let's see, do I have something covered up over here? Maybe, let's scroll down and see. Um, before we get to that one, let's look. Okay, nothing, nothing there. Let's go back to the top. Yeah, here we go. All right, let's see if we can write chemical formulas. Right. Remember, when we were discussing um, the symbols for elements, the symbols also have reserved places around them for information, right? This one is the atomic number. In that position, the number of protons. This one is the mass number, the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. This one is the charge. If there's nothing there, then it's neutral, right? We don't have to write zero. You only write plus one, plus two, plus three, minus one, minus two, whatever the case may be. Down here is the number 
of atoms. Right. We use that one when we're forming molecules and compounds. How many atoms are there? Right. So when we write the formula, we need the symbol, and they've been kind enough to give you the symbols for each one of these. So this one would be H2O. You need two hydrogens and one oxygen. Now, why didn't, write, why didn't I write it OH2? <laughs> well, we haven't got there yet. We have to talk about, I don't think we've gotten there yet. I think that's in chapter four. Let me take a quick look. Chemical bonding, ionic bond model, structures, yes. Yeah. Chapter four and five. We actually start talking about um, names associated with formulas. So that's why they've made this one really simple. So it'd be H2O, this one would be CO2. And the next one would be O2. And the next one would be CO. So if there's only one of them, you don't write a subscript, right? If the symbol's there, there's at least one of them. So writing a subscript one would be redundant. And uh, scientists, uh, hate redundancy almost as much as ambiguity. So we'll talk more about that when we get into chapter four and five. Okay, uh, so let's let's move down. Uh, well, okay. Do we have an element? or a compound in these cases, right? We'll go through these quick. All you have to do really is just look at, uh, do you have more than one element, right? Lithium, carbon, oxygen, that's a compound. Lithium, chlorine, oxygen, that's a compound. N, little o, that's an element. It's not one that you had to memorize though, but you should recognize it since the O is small, that's an element. It actually stands for nobelium. Big N, big O, that's a compound, nitrogen and oxygen together. Okay, so let's move down. How are we doing on, yeah, oh well. I might as well just take the necessary time. Uh, how about uh, 85? So for 85, the question is, uh, what would be the subscript X for this compound? If the formula unit contains six atoms, BAS2, BA, S2, and O, and we want to put a, a number here so that we have six atoms. So we have one, two, three. We need three more. Right? That's simple. This one is a little more complex. Al2, S, O, X, 3. Okay. We need to figure out what X is. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about these later. This, this represents a polyatomic ion. But for now, all we need is to know what's the total number, 17 atoms. So we have two here, right? How many sulfurs do we have? We have three outside the parentheses, which means we have three of these groups, which means there are actually three sulfurs here. So that's five atoms. 17 total means you need 12 oxygens, but you don't put 12 here because three times 12 is 36. Three divided into 12 is four. So if we make this one four, 
Now we have 12 oxygens, right? 12 oxygens. That's a tricky one. All right. Um, I'm going to skip that one and move on. Okay, that's chapter one. Good. Now we can get into chapter two. That only took me an hour. So my guess is it's, it's going to be uh, maybe noon before I get finished. <clears throat> okay, so let's. Uh, I'm going to stop the share on this one. See, I want to put that one down and stop this share. Stop the share. Now I'm going to share chapter two, which is right here. Okay. Let's see, move that over here as far as I can. All right. So now we're talking about uh, things having to do with calculations, measurements and calculations in chemistry. That's what chapter two is all about. And there are some definitions. We're not going to go through the definitions. We're going to look at, at examples. Um, just to get us warmed up, what's the main reason that scientists prefer the metric system over the uh, imperial or English system, we call it? It's, it's really simple. <laughs> it's the uh, it's the base of the system. Metric system is based on tens and powers of tens, which is very easy to manipulate for very large numbers, very small numbers, intermediates. Powers of ten means that all you have to do is move the decimal. Right? The English system has a mix, a hodgepodge of different units of measure. And you have to memorize them. In fact, England has virtually given up, I think officially, they've given up their monetary system that uses all these strange subdivisions of the pound. And they've gone to a decimal conversion for the pound. So any subdivisions of the pound, which is the, the base unit for currency in England, is a decimal of some sort. The US monetary system is also decimal based. Okay. Uh, so if we have um, fundamental units, fundamental units of measurement have a standard of identity. Uh, standard, standardized. That scientists everywhere agree upon. So for mass, it's the kilogram. For length, it's the meter. Right? For um, mass, length, time is the second. Um, let's see. My mind's gone blank. <clears throat> anyway, uh, those are fundamental units. Now, there are derived units from these. Right? A derived unit from this one would be a gram. A derived unit from that one would be a kilometer. Derived unit from this one would be a millisecond. Right? Normally, the, uh, the derived unit would take the fundamental unit and apply a prefix to it. Right? But in this case, it's strange. For mass, the standard unit it has the prefix. So you just need to know what the kilo means. Kilo means a thousand. So the standard unit is a thousand times that one. 
but the derived unit here is a thousand times the meter. And this one's a thousandth, 10 to the minus three of the second. Okay. <clears throat> but there are other units that we call uh, base units. Sometimes the base unit is a fundamental unit, like the meter. But other times it's a derived unit. So a derived unit from, um, from the standard meter would be the liter for volume. And actually the derived unit comes from the deci, let's see, uh, cubic decimeter, meter, cubic decimeter is the liter. But now the liter becomes the base unit. So you can use base units with prefixes also. So the milliliter is the standard in, in medical professions, of course, and in most labs uh, as a, uh, a small unit of volume. It's a thousandth of a liter. Uh, now in Europe and the rest of the world, actually, when you pump gas, you pump liters of gas into your tank. Only in America you pump gallons. Um, okay, so we have these prefixes, right? Here's an example. Milli is abbreviated small m, and it means 10 to the minus third of the base unit. G, right? Anybody who has a computer, interested in computers, knows G. Giga. Giga is uh, a billion times. So it would be, um, let's see, two, three, yeah. Uh, hold on a second. Oh, I was looking at the wrong one. Okay. Yeah, it's 10 to the ninth times. And the, the word would be giga. Nano. Nano is a is a prefix is n. N by itself means something else, but n in front of a unit of measure means nano, and that's 10 to the minus ninth. So if giga, here's a problem. Let's just erase that too. So if you have a, a, a gigameter, right, you have 10 to the ninth meters. If you have a nanometer, you have 10 to the minus ninth meters. Okay. Now, uh, how much bigger is a giga than a nano? Well, a meter is a billion times bigger than a nanometer, right? It'd be uh, 10 to the ninth times to get to a meter. And go from a meter to a gigameter is another 10 to the ninth, right? So to go from here to here is 10 to the 18th. See that? So 10 to the 18th times that one would give you this one. Those, sometimes we refer to those as orders of magnitude. Powers of 10 is what that means. So one order of magnitude is the difference of one power of 10. So if I had 10 squared here of something and 10 to the first power here, it would be one order of magnitude increase. All right, um, what does 10 to the sixth mean? 10 to the sixth is mega with a capital M. How about this little funny little letter here? What is that? Well, that's the Greek letter mu, M-U, mu. And it stands for micro. 
So you put micro in here. And it means multiply the base unit by 10 to the minus 6. So it's a millionth of the base unit. Okay? Uh, milli would be 10 to the minus third times the base unit. Uh, up here I've got deci is a little d, 10 to the minus 2. Right? A hundredth of. How about pico? With a little p is 10 to the minus 12th. That's even smaller than a nano. Okay, let's see. Okay, we don't have any more up there. Let's move on down and look at, uh, all right. If you know the, the meaning of these prefixes, ordering these things is no problem. Okay, this is a good um, this is a good question. Number nine, which of the two given units is the more logical unit for expressing each of the following measurements? So, what what do we mean by logical unit? Well, we generally think of uh, what's manageable, right? If you have to express a unit of measure in terms of uh, scientific notation All right we're going to get to that uh, discussion in a minute say you had three times ten to the uh, minus three meters it might be easier if you express that in terms of uh, millimeters right so that would be millimeter ten to the minus three meters is a millimeter so three millimeters would be easier to handle. So that's what we're getting at here. Which one is easier to handle? And usually you're talking about how can you change it so that you're only using a number between one and 10. Okay, let's look at the possibilities. Thickness of your chemistry book. Um, would that be easier to express in centimeters or meters? No, centimeters, of course, right? Centimeters about like that. It's about, uh, well, it takes two and a half centimeters to make an inch. So if an inch is that, then centimeters like that. So expressing the thickness of your book in centimeters would be more logical. How about the mass of a cantaloupe? Cantaloupe seed, right? The cantaloupe, yeah, in kilograms might be logical. But the seed, milligrams, would be more logical because it's so small. Capacity of your girl's gas tank. Express that in milliliters. <laughs> that would be in millions of milliliters. Now, liters would be better. Let's see, if you have a 20 gallon gas tank, uh, how many liters is that? Well, it's about, um, about 70 liters. Length of a man's tie in decimeters or micrometers? Decimeters would be more logical. Yeah. Decimeter is a tenth of a meter. So a tenth of a meter is like that. And your tie would be maybe two and a half to three decimeters. Okay. That was fun. We'll move on. Uncertainty in measurements. Okay. So let's see. How about I can move this over a little bit. Yeah, now I can see it better. Identify the estimated digit in each of the following measurements. So um, you've got, when you write a number, we'll take the first one, for example, 234. When you make a measurement and you report it, every scientist on the planet, if they remember their schooling, knows that you're claiming certainty for those two. And the last one to the right, you're claiming uncertainty. In this problem, they're calling it estimated. Uncertain or estimated. 
In reality, it's a guess. Right? You're just guessing at it. You're trying to make the best guess you can. But it's still a guess. So uh, the estimated digit in each of the following is four for that one. How about B, 234.0? Okay, now you're claiming that this is the uncertain one. Zero is the estimated one. How about 0 0.234? Well, four again is the position that's estimated. How about 0 0.00234? Four also is estimated. Notice one thing about those decimal fractions. they're always preceded by a zero. If you have a decimal out to the left and there are no whole numbers beyond it, you better put a zero there. I mean, <coughs> I have so many students that write 0.234. And my guess is that's the way you were taught in grade school and high school. Well, um, no, not meaning any disrespect, your teachers are wrong. You need a zero there for one reason, if for no other, to separate that decimal from a period in a sentence. Right? You can't tell the difference. Uh, maybe that's why in Europe they reverse them. The decimals are commas. They stick a comma in there for a decimal point and um, for a, um, uh, a large number where you're dividing units out, like um, uh, 93 million. The number of miles distance to the sun in our country, in America, we put commas there, right? To mark off the thousands. In Europe, they put decimals. And then if you have a number like this, they put a comma, okay? And on one level, that makes sense. Now you can't get that one confused with another decimal. You confuse it with a comma, but it's, it's less likely to happen. Okay, let's move on. Let's see here. Um, Let's look at measurements here. Consider the following rulers as instruments for the measurement of length. All right. So let me get my, uh, uh, my drawing utensil here. If, um, which one would be more accurate? Okay, look at this. They're all centimeters here. Centimeters, 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 centimeters. So the major divisions are referenced to centimeters as the base unit. So this one would be one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. That's good. This one would be one, two, three centimeters, but you also have tenths of a centimeter, okay? Here you have 10 times a centimeter. Uh, I, uh, let's see, 10 times a centimeter would be a, a decimeter. Each one of these would be a decimeter. But if we're in centime uh, centimeters, the estimation is different. This one is, tens of centimeters with subdivisions. Well, each one of these subdivisions is one centimeter, correct? Okay, so let's say, uh, what is the length here? Well, the certain numbers are ones that you have markings for. Right? So for the first one, you have markings for two and three. So your certain number is two, but not quite three. So now you're gonna go decimals, 
between two and three. What is it? It looks like it's uh, average maybe seven, 2.7 centimeters. The last position was a guess. How about the next one? Well, let's see. Uh, two point, okay, that one is, that's sitting right on the point seven. But we need a last estimate. So if, if you think it's sitting on that seven, then the last estimate would be zero. Okay. How about the next one? That one is between 20 and 30. So you would start with 20, but you would need to estimate the one's position. So that one would be 27 centimeters. And this would be the uncertain digit right here. How about the last one? Okay, that one is marked off in centimeters. So it's 27 exactly. And the last one would be an estimate. Okay, so that's what you would have for answers to each one of these measurements. And the more accurate measurement for the first two group would be number two. And the more accurate for the second two would be number four, simply because it's calibrated in a finer division. Okay, uh, I see what's happening. Every time I use that annotation tool, it messes with my mouse. There we go. Okay, significant figures. All right. Significant figures. So, <clears throat> determine the number of significant figures in each of the following measurements. Let's, let's review our significant figure rules, right? All right, so you have, um, break down your rules. You have um, all non-zero digits. Significant. Okay. That leaves zero. What do you do with the zeros? All non-zeros are significant. Zeros depends on where the zero is located. Okay, you have three types of zeros. First type. Left hand, all the way on the left. Non-significant. always on the left. If they're on the left and no non-zero numbers out there, they're not significant. Two, um, bracketed. Bracketed zeros, which means what? A zeros between non-zeros. They can be one zero between two non-zeros. They can be two, three, four, however many between two non-zeros they're always significant. And those to the right, those to the right are uh, A, significant if If there's a decimal anywhere in that number, the one on the right is significant. B, not significant if no decimal. Okay, so those are your review of your rules. Now there's one other one. There's the exact number. This one is infinite significant digits. 
There's no limit. Exact numbers are always treated as if they have infinite number. There's no restriction on your calculation from an exact number. Uh, okay, hold on a second. I left some, some junk down here, sorry. Erase that, okay, there we go. I gotta stop using that annotation tool. It's really clunky. Okay, so let's take our example. Okay, um, 29 examples, 0 0.444. How many significant figures are in this number? There's a decimal. These are all non-zeros. And that zero doesn't count because it's to the left. So there are three significant figures there. How about this one? There's three there too. How about this one? Uh, four, zero, four, zero. These zeros don't count. That zero is bracketed. And this zero is to the right with a decimal. So we have one, two, three, four. And the last one. 0 0.000, another one, yeah, another one, four. How many significant figures there? Just one. Okay, how about, uh, let's see, I was looking for, how about 31? Let's look down at 31 for a second. We won't look at all of them, but I wanted to make a point with some of that information. How about uh, 275.00, 275.00. .00. Significant figures, non-zeros, zeros to the right with a decimal. You got five here. How about this one? Um, 275.00. Zero, zero. Non-zeros, zeros to the right with no decimal. They don't count, only three. How could we make those zeros count? If we meant to make them count. Put a decimal right there. Okay. Uh, so let me look down. Okay, there's nothing more there. Let's go back up, see what we got here. Uh, uh, right, we, all right, we could do this one because it introduced the con concept of magnitude of uncertainty. <clears throat> well, I, I don't think we talked about this in lecture. So we'll just take a couple of examples. Uh, they've given you an example there. Let's take a different one. So for, uh, let's say, well, let's take the next one, 5371. Okay. This one is the uncertain one, right? So we have, but we still have four significant figures, right? Four significant figures. And we have estimated digit in the measurement is this one right here, okay? The magnitude of uncertainty, if we know nothing else about the number, right? There, there are different ways to determine 
this uncertainty measurement, right? But if we're just given the number, then we would say the magnitude of uncertainty is plus or minus one. It's in the position of the uncertain number right there. In, in reality, it could be more than that, right? But you would need statistical evidence to determine what that number was. But we are, for this purpose, we're saying at a minimum, it's plus or minus one. It could be more. Okay, uh, for something like 0 0.41, You have two significant figures and you have plus or minus 0 0.01. This position right here is the uncertain one. So that's why it's 0 0.01, point two places over one. Okay. If any of you are, are interested in taking the statistics course, um, you'll learn about that and actually calculate values. Okay, uh, let's see. I'm falling behind with my hard copy here. Let's, let's go probably the next page. Oh, we got one at the bottom. Significant figures in math operations. All right. 41 is just an exercise in rounding, right? Just to be sure that you don't make rounding errors. So, um, in this case, if we're gonna round this number to four places, you start from the left and you work your way over. One, two, three, four. Then you look to position five to see if it's five or greater. Six is greater. So now the number would be 0 0.3508. Four significant figures rounded from that parent number. The next one, three significant figures, 13.43. We would look here, that's less than five. The number would be 13.4, okay? Um, let's do D. That could be confusing. 0 0.030303. Three significant figures. So how do you tell? So these two zeros are not significant. So we have to start here. One, two, three. Look to the right. That's a zero. That means these two are gone. Point, 0 0.0303. Three significant figures rounded correctly. You need to know how to do that because your calculator doesn't care. Your calculator is gonna spit out as many digits as you ask it to. If you set it up, you configure it to give you nine digits, assuming your uh, screen is lo long enough, <laughs> then it's gonna give you every one of them. And you have to decide how many can you keep. Okay, let's see, I got something in the way here. Eh, no, that's nothing. Okay. How about operations? There we go. What do you do with significant figures in your answer based on the operators, the numbers, not the operators, the numbers in your calculation. Okay, well, we, remember we have two types of rules, right? Rule number one. Somebody return. Yeah, my internet's going out, uh, I guess because of the storm and the weather. Okay, I, do I already have you checked on? Yeah, I've been coming in and out. I, it's okay. I just want to be sure I don't miss somebody that shows up. All righty. Uh, also, I got a scanner. It just came in today, so I can scan all those onto my computer for the lab assignments and post them. 
where you sent a message saying you couldn't see it. Yeah, that's that's great. Scanning is perfect. All righty. Um, okay, so we have two rules. Uh, rule one is for multiply, divide. It's real simple. When you have a series of multiplies and divides, you can do them all at once. And at the end, you just look back to your numbers for the least significant figures in any of your numbers. The least number of significant figures determines the number that you can keep in your answer. That's the easy rule. The second rule is for add, subtract. And this would work for powers too, right? because it's multiply or roots. It, it would work, it's like a negative power. But actually that, that would be a, a simple because if you're gonna take the power of a number, you're starting off with significant figures in one number and just using the same, so it's just that one. But add, subtract, you line up the decimals or the implied decimals, right? And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So if we take, um, if we take that first one uh, here, 10.300 times 0 0.30 times 0 0.300, how many significant figures can you have in your answer? Well, this one has five in it, doesn't it? This one has two, and this one has three. You can only have two significant figures in your answer. Um, let's do add, subtract. Add, subtract, uh, let's multiply, divide, more, multiply, divide. I want to add, subtract. Here we go. So that first one. Uh, 12, 23, 127. 12, 23, 127. We lined up the implied decimals. Here, there, there, there. And then we get, uh, let's see, 12, carry the one, five, six, one. So we may have had two significant figures here, two there and three there, but our answer has three because we can keep everything to that, to the least number of decimals, right? If this one had been like three, then we had three there. We could only keep this decimal. The three is gone. Okay. So that's lining up the decimals. What if you have, um, well, if you have, actual decimal points, it's simple. Just line up the decimals and then you're limited to the least number. Let's do the second one. That, that's a good example. Uh, 3.111, 3.11 and 3.1, I think. Correct? Yeah. So we get one, two, three point nine. We can only keep that position. So our answer is 9.3. All right. So we may have had two here, three there, and three and four there, but we only have two in our answer. Now, uh, let's see, I don't see an example that I, I'll just make one up. How about this one? Um, Two, four, five, six, uh, one, two, three, and five, zero, six, zero. How about that one? You got nine, eight, thirteen, carry the one, six, seven. Okay, I think that's right. Nine, six, thirteen, six. Okay, that's what your calculator would give you. How many of those can we keep? Notice that that decimal is implied but not explicit, which means that zero is not significant. 
So we're actually limited to this position here. So we would round that one to this position, but we need a placeholder. If we don't have that placeholder, then we think that's the ones position, when actually it's the tens position. So we have to keep the zero, and that zero is not significant. So we're kosher, right? We're only keeping three significant figures because of that limitation. I, I don't find many textbooks that tell you that. They just give you those other rules and let you figure it out on your own. Okay. So that's, uh, now if you have a, a number, a calculation with mixed rules, like add, subtract, multiply, divide, and that type of stuff, then you have to use your uh, rules order. Right? Parentheses first. Right? If you got parentheses, you do everything inside the parentheses before you do anything else. Then you can do exponents. Then you can do multiply and then divide and then add, subtract. So ideally, let's hope that a complex calculation where it has a mix of these will have parentheses <laughs> because um, the absence of parentheses, if you do it by this order, can give you an entirely different answer than if you have parentheses. That's one of the reasons I don't like algebraic calculators, which is most of them on the market. It's like one plus one equals two. You have to hit all those buttons. One, then punch plus, and then one, and then the equals button. Those types of calculators, if you don't put parentheses in there on a complex calculation, it will give you the wrong answer. Whereas my calculator is reverse Polish notation. And that method of operating a calculator uh, eliminates parentheses altogether. You don't need them. Anyway, um, let's move on. I catch myself getting long winded here. Let's see. No, nothing up there. Uh, let's see. We haven't got to a, there's conversion factors, but we haven't done a complex calculation, it looks like. All right. In the interest of time, let's move on to conversion factors. What is a conversion factor? You only need a conversion factor if you want to change the units. You have a number with units and you want to change it to something else, then you need a conversion factor, sometimes more than one conversion factor. So why do conversion factors work? I mean, what is a conversion factor? Let's use an example. Okay, um, let's do, let's convert um, millimeters to meters, 77D. Ten to the eighth millimeters. Uh, we didn't go over um, scientific notation rules, did we? In order to use scientific nation to don't <laughs> scientific notation, you need a coefficient and a power of ten. But the coefficient always has to be between one and ten. Well, that's it. That's the rule <laughs> for scientific notation. Um, when you uh, let's see. I was going somewhere with that, but I've forgotten. So let's move on. So we need a conversion factor that will go to meters. This is where you are, and this is where you want to be. Okay? You need a factor that will cancel this and give you that. So your end game is in the numerator. 
and your cancel unit is in the denominator. That way, these two cancel. Now we need what's the ratio, what's the relationship between meters and millimeters? Well, how many millimeters does it take to make a meter? A thousand, right? There you go. So now you just resolve that equation. All right? This is in the numerator. So 10 to the eighth divided by 10 to the third is what? 10 to the fifth. You subtract the denominator from the numerator. So 10 to the fifth, and then you keep your coefficient. So three times 10 to the fifth meters is three times 10 to the eighth millimeters. We could move the decimal place, you know, so some, sometimes that's helpful, but for dimensional analysis, for conversion factor usage, this is the logic that you follow. Now, if we don't have a single conversion factor that will go from here to here, we may need more than one, and that's fine. You just stack them up, chain them together. As long as you're canceling, as you go, cancel, 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 and you end up with the one you need, and each conversion factor is valid, then there's no law against it. So why do conversion factors work? Remember we have this is equal to that. If that's equal to that, then we better not multiply it by anything but the number one, right? If you multiply it by two, then that can't be equal to that in conversion factors. But if your conversion factor is equal to one, you can use it to multiply and both sides are equal still. And in order to do that, you need an equality. So something like, um, look on your milk jugs when you go to the store. They're now they're marked gallon jug is, is, has a, a liter uh, volume also assigned to it. So one gallon equals 3.8 liters. Right? So there's your equivalence. And you can make a conversion factor out of that any way you want. If you've got gallons first, let's say we have four gallons. We want to convert it to liters. Which one of these goes on top? Well, we're headed for liters, aren't we? And we want to cancel gallons. So now four times 3.8 is the number of liters in four gallons. But this, this number right here, because we divided through by, uh, yeah, we divided everything through by one gallon. This is equal to one. That means this is equal to one. It means this is equal to one. That's a conversion factor. All conversion factors are equal to one. All right, uh, let's see. We did talk a little bit about density. And I think the, the idea there is to introduce the concept of uh, equations and solving equations, right? Density is mass divided by volume, okay? Um, if it's a liquid, we usually say uh, grams per milliliter. If it's a solid, we usually say grams per cubic centimeter. It really doesn't matter. Those are equivalent. Grams are equal to grams. Milliliter is exactly the same size as the cubic centimeter. So if you have a number out here, it's the same for both of them. Okay, so if we were to do a calculation, 
we could say, okay, I know how much it weighs for this volume. I take a certain volume and put it on the balance. Then I can divide the mass by the volume and get the density. But suppose you have the density and you want to find out uh, the volume. Then you just need to uh, take the mass and solve for the volume. Okay. Anytime you have an equation in as many variables as there are, if one of them is unknown and the rest are known, you can always solve for it. Right? We could solve for volume just by doing this. Or we could solve for mass just by doing this. Okay. That's the point of this whole exercise in density is learning how to solve equations. I know you learned, if you took algebra, you learned how to solve equations, but that was really abstract, unless your teacher was, was good at using examples from real life. But when you get to chemistry, don't forget all that stuff you learned, because you're gonna need it. Learning how to solve equations. Okay. I got five minutes left until I'm over time. So I'm going to let these uh, density problems go. They're really just extensions of what I discussed there, solutions to those problems. Now, oh, with one addition. Suppose uh, you need to find the volume of an irregular object. Right? Getting the mass is easy. You just put it on a balance. But suppose it's irregular. You can't use a uh, geometric formula to determine the volume of your object. And it's, it's not a sphere, it's not a cube, it's not a rec rectangle, it's not even a trapezoid. It's not even a, a cone, something regular. It's irregular. So how do you find the volume of it? Well, you submerge it in a liquid right? and measure the difference, right? You have a certain volume before, stick it in the liquid as long as it's completely submerged and the rise in the level of your liquid is the volume of your object. Now the trick is to pick the right liquid. Right? If, it's, if it's not water soluble and it doesn't react with water, water's a good choice. Just drop it in water. Uh, if it reacts with water, you wanna use a different liquid. Like if it's uh, sodium, you have a chunk of sodium, you want to know the volume of that chunk of sodium. You don't drop it in water. <laughs> or you, you have a violent reaction. <clears throat> so you would use something like oil, mineral oil. Okay, uh, enough said about that. Let's see, I think we're due, are we ready to go to more about conversion factors? Or is that it? That's it. We're ready for chapter three. Okay. We're just about out of time, so um, you won't hurt my feelings if you have to go. If you want to stick around, fine. Uh, no problem with that. So let me share the next one. Chapter three. We're going to talk about the periodic table. Where did I put it? Here it is. There we go. So, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> okay, no. Um, I'll bring up the periodic table when we get to those topics. Right now, we're going to talk about the structure of the atom. Right? I mentioned it earlier, the positions around the symbol that were reserved for certain information. Right? And then we'll we'll move on from that. Which subatomic particle correctly matches each of the following phrases? Okay, um, possesses a negative charge. What has a negative charge in the atom? The electron. Right, that's the only one. What has no charge? Well, of the subatomic particles, the neutron has no charge. Has a mass slightly less than that of a neutron. That would be the proton. 
Another way of saying that is the neutron is just a hair heavier than the proton. They're almost identical in mass. Which one has a charge equal to, but opposite in sign from that of an electron? Well, that's the proton. But they're wildly different masses. Okay, anything? No, nothing down there. Let's go back up and see nothing there. How about this? This one right here. Scooch it over a little bit. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons are present in atoms with the following characteristics? Okay, if we say Sn for 10, it has a 50 in the z position and a 118 in the a position. We have 50 protons. We have 118 protons plus neutrons. So that means we have how many neutrons? We have 68 neutrons. How many electrons do you have? Is there a charge on that symbol? No, no charge. That means you have 50 electrons. The charge is balanced. Okay. If you put a, uh, a charge up there, let's just do that. Uh, 10, 50, 118. N, 50, 118. That's neutral. What if we put a two plus charge there? How many electrons do you have now? You don't have the same number, right? We, you cannot change the charge of an atom by adding or subtracting protons. Why is that? If you change the number of protons, you don't have 10 anymore. So the only way to get a charge is <coughs> addition or subtraction of electrons. <coughs> so an imbalance favors two protons, which means you had to remove two negative charges. So there are two less. Actually, two fewer electrons. Fewer is the proper term for discrete units. Less is for continuous comparisons. Okay, uh, so let's move on. So you know how to get number of protons, number of neutrons out of the Z number and the A number, and the number of electrons based on the charge. So we won't stop at any, any ones that say charge. Uh, okay. Well, let's see. This, well, now let's, uh, I, I eliminated that one for a purpose. Ah, let's complete this chart. Maybe I can use the annotation for this one. Uh, let me make it bigger. How about that? I'm gonna make that chart bigger. Let's say 400. There we go. I'm having trouble seeing that one. Now I'm gonna annotate, I'm gonna pull up the annotate with text. Here we go. Okay, so uh, you're given an example here. Chlorine with 17 Z number and 37 A number, which means it has 17 atomic number, mass number 37, protons 17, right? Same as the Z number and neutrons 17 from 37, okay? So if we have a mass number of 232 and the number of no neutrons is 138, how many protons do you have? Well, 138 from 232. Can I do that in my head? It's probably not a good idea. Uh, 94? Let's see if I'm right. Yeah, 
I surprised myself. 94. Okay. How many, what's the atomic number? The atomic number is 94. Same as the number of protons. All right. Now, what's the symbol? This one's going to be a little more difficult. I can't, the tools here are, are just not friendly. So what is that symbol? 94 protons. You look at your periodic table for the atomic number. 94 is plutonium. Plutonium with uh, 94 here and 232 here, like that. Okay. How about this one? I'm not going to use that annotation anymore. Let me just erase it. Okay. Get rid of that. I don't need that. <clears throat> okay. How many, what's the atomic number? 16. The mass number? 32. Number of protons? 16. Number of neutrons? 16. Okay. Uh, I think we've done enough of that one. You get the idea. <clears throat> and these are for all neutral atoms. Right? If we added a couple of columns out there, we could talk about uh, charge. Okay, let's see. Is there anything up here that is identified? Uh, no, we're not going to do that. <clears throat> so let's go to the next section. Isotopes and atomic mass. <clears throat> okay, calculate the atomic mass for of each of the following elements using the given data for the percentage abundance of the mass of each isotope. Okay, now... When they say atomic mass, that's different than the mass number. The mass number is simply the total of protons and neutrons, but the atomic mass is actually a calculation, a weighted average for all of the naturally occurring abundance of isotopes of that element. So how do you do that? Do it the same way or a similar way to calculating your grade point average. Some isotopes are given more weight than others because they're more abundant. So the course that you make an A in, if it has three credit hours or four credit hours, is much more valuable to your GPA than one that only has one credit hour. So let's see, uh, let's do magnesium because it has so many parts to it. So for magnesium, and I'm going to use Henry Ford here, 78.99% of uh, magnesium 24, 78.99%, and its atomic mass units for that isotope are 23.99. Now, why doesn't it weigh 24, right? If it's just, if it's just protons and, and neutrons, right? well, electrons are a little, they add a little bit. But why is it that and not this? Because it's referenced to carbon-12 is the standard. Carbon-12 is the only isotope that is fixed. At 12 atomic mass units per atom. That's our point of reference. So everything else, it could be a whole number, but it's unlikely, but measured against carbon, 
it has 23.99 atomic mass units. Okay. Uh, what other isotopes are in abundance here? 10% uh, of magnesium 25. And its mass is 24.99. And one more isotope, don't we have 11.01% of this isotope? Oops. Is that right? Yep. And it's 25.98 atomic mass units. Now, how do we calculate the average, the um, atomic mass that's reported in the periodic table? It's reported at 24.305 on this table. How do we get that out of this? Well, you take this fractional abundance, which is 0 0.7899. Right, we're going to remove the percent and convert it into a decimal fraction. So this would be. 0 point and 0 point and 0 point times each one of these. Okay. That's the, the contribution of each of these to the total, to the average. So let's see, how fast can I do this? 23.99 times. Okay. Um, 18.95. Okay. The next one, uh, well, one tenth of that. 2.499. 2.499. Actually, yeah, that's rounded off. In fact, to the third place is that. And then this one is 0 0.1101. It's 25.98 is 2.860. And you add them together. Nope, that was wrong. 18.95. Oops. 2.499. And 2.86. Okay, 24.309. Atomic mass units. Okay, so I ended up, uh, I was off by four hundreds, uh, four thousandths in that place. Could be a rounding error. It could be a fact that they're taking into account for the periodic table more isotopes than we're given here because there may be more than just three. Could be more than that. That skew the value just a little bit. So that's how you calculate the um, atomic mass from abundance data. Uh, here's a good one, 33. The element copper has an atomic mass of 63.55 atomic mass units and has two naturally occurring isotope forms. Based on this information, indicate whether each of the following statements is true or false. 
Okay. So um, how about A? All copper atoms have a mass of 63.55 AMU. <laughs> no, not hardly. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to do all this stuff. In fact, Dalton's atomic theory, this is one of the places where it fell apart because Dalton believed that all atoms of a given element were identical, but they're not. They're isotopes. So uh, A is false. How about B? Some copper atoms have a mass of 63.55 AMU. Um, no, and for one reason, that value is an average. We can't say that some have a mass of 63.55. There's no evidence for it because it is an average. Now, by coincidence, actually, no, it couldn't be. No, there can't be any. None of them are 63.55 because it's a weighted average of two different isotopes. So if any of them were actually a mass in the middle, then that would be a different isotope because this isotope weighs that much, this isotope weighs that much, and nothing in the middle. It's a weighted average of the two. So B is false. Uh, some copper atoms have a mass less than 63.55. That's true. Because it's an average, it's in the middle somewhere between those two isotopes. And D would also be true. Some have a mass greater than that. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me go back up and... See, okay, we've done enough of that. Now we're gonna get into the periodic table. Now, um, I'm gonna unshare this one and bring up the periodic table because uh, holding this one up against the camera just doesn't do it for me. So let me stop the share and bring up the periodic table. Share, and let's see, here it is. Okay, so there we got a periodic table. And yeah, we can see everything there, maximum size. All right, so <clears throat> the periodic table is divided. Uh, maybe I will try annotation as much as I hate it. Uh, let's see, how about... Hmm, it's a box. Let me use a line first. Periodic table is divided into two sections, two major sections, right? See this black line that goes right down there, kind of on a diagonal? That divides nonmetals from this side and metals on this side. So most of the periodic table is occupied by metals. Now, um, there are elements that are close to that black line that exhibit sometimes metallic behavior and sometimes non-metallic behavior, depending on the environment. What are they are trying to do? Uh, silicon's one of them. Germanium is one of them. Arsenic, SB, antimony. Those are called metalloids. And they, they are actually instrumental in the success of our semiconductor industry, like our calculators, cell phones, computers, telecommunications of all kinds uh, are dependent upon those elements, plus minor components of others. 
Okay. So that's a major division. Um, let's see. We also have um, group names. Right. So uh, let's see. What, do I, what if I do this one? This one. That's not big enough. What if I do this one? There. Those are alkali metals. They, they just have that name, right? My guess is that the, that was inherited from medieval times. Alkali metals. These, second one, those are alkaline earths or alkaline earth metals. And they all behave similarly. Not exactly, just similar. They're family members, right? I don't behave exactly the same as my brother, but we have certain characteristics in common. Um, work the other direction. This group is noble gases or inert gases. That group is halogens. They're all similar. These are calcogens, C-H-A-L-C-O-G-E-N. These are nictogens. P-N-I-C-T-O-G-E-N, -E the nitrogen group. Uh, these other guys don't have names, special names. Uh, these in here between three and 12 are transition metals or transition elements. Uh, these groups down here, which are fit right into this crack right there, there and there, are often called inner transition elements but they also have their series name the lanthanides are these top ones because they start with lanthanum and these are the actinides because they start with actinium okay um then there are the uh there's also another general group where we combine these two groups, the alkaline metal, metals, the alkaline earths, and these last six groups, they're called representative elements. I don't know why they're named that. Um, they do have some things in common, but that's just the, the way it is. They're representative elements. Okay, so let me see, I can go backwards, I think. So that's the periodic table. And um, I'm going to have to unshare it so I can get back to the uh, number three group. Share three. Here we go. Okay. So now, <clears throat> what is the periodic law? The periodic law was discovered. Um, I'm not sure if Mendeleev discovered it or he just uh, put it in a usable form. What was noticed was that certain elements behave similarly and they needed to be in groups. So Mendeleev did do that. <clears throat> Well, after a couple of other scientists, but he, he pulled it all together. Let's put it that way. But Mendeleev also used the concept of atomic number that he, no, not atomic number. Uh, he was before atomic number. He put them in order of atomic weight, but he did it in such a way that they went from left to right, increasing atomic weight. But he noticed that when he got down to increasing and he got down to here, then the next one didn't have a group. In fact, it behaved like this group. So he took that one and put it down here and started a new period 
they call it. Went to the end of a period, double back, started a new period. Oh, found another one down here. It's just like that one up here. Start over again. That's the periodic law. Periodically, based on increasing atomic weight, you have to double back and put your elements in the proper groups so that their behavior is similar. That's the periodic law in a nutshell. And the periodic table was developed out of that. Okay, so um, where would we find, I'm gonna have to use this table after all. I can't share two things at once. I wish I could, but Zoom don't, won't do that. Uh, I don't think anybody can do that. Um, where do we find beryllium, right? Beryllium is here in the second group, right? So it's in group number, uh, Arabic number two and Roman numeral two, okay? Two different systems. The, the more recent system is the one through 18. Right? The older system has Roman numerals and it goes 1A, 2A, 3A, skips all these right here. Four, five, six, seven, and eight A. And that'll become obvious, but well, it should already be obvious, but we'll mention it. So there's beryllium. Uh, let's skip to say phosphorus. So phosphorus is over here. It's in the nictogens. It's Roman numeral five, group 15. Okay. And both of those were representative elements. All right, that just see, uh, checks to see if you can find the elements on the periodic table. How about 47? Which one of these, in each of these groups, which ones would have, uh, which two of these elements of each of the groups have similar properties? That means they would be in the vertical grouping. Potassium, is there any other one there that's with potassium? Copper's not there. Ah, rubidium, rubidium is, is just below potassium, right? So it would have the same uh, general chemical characteristics, properties. How about this one? <clears throat> Aluminum. Uh, no, silicon, 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 silicon's under carbon, right? I don't see anything else with that one. Silicon, how about phosphorus? <coughs> <coughs> phosphorus. So if we look at phosphorus, <coughs> just below it is arsenic. Phosphorus and arsenic have similar behaviors because they're in the same column. <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, let's look at well, let's see. Those are too simple. What's the non-metal in each one of these? The, the uh, non-metal in each one of these is sulfur for that one. Sodium and potassium are on the other side of the chart. Uh, copper and lithium are both metals. Phosphorus is a non-metal. Uh, beryllium and calcium are metals. Iodine is a non-metal. It's a halogen. Uh, iron and gallium are metals. Chlorine is a non-metal. Okay, let's see. Uh, all right, now we're gonna talk about structure. Yeah, let's talk about uh, electronic configurations. Well, actually, hold on a second. Electronic arrangements with atoms. Okay, that's fine. Um, so this first one, 
how many electrons can be accommodated in an electron orbital of each of the following types? Okay, we may need to review. <clears throat> review quantum numbers, right? So N, in this case, is the principal quantum number. And its defining characteristic is energy level. So every electron in that N number has similar energy level, not the exactly the same. Well, not always exactly the same, but similar. Um, then L is the um, magnetic quantum number. No, not, not the magnetic, that's the, uh, well, shoot, my mind's gone blank. Okay, we got L, we got M sub L, we got M sub S. Okay. Uh, angular momentum. Angular momentum. Quantum number. And this has to do with shape. Okay. The magnetic quantum number has to do with direction. Or you might say it's not always direction because it depends on the shape. So we say direction or um, geometry. <clears throat> and this is spin. Okay. <clears throat> Each one of these below is derived from the one above. These numbers can be starting with one, two, three, four, on out. Okay. These can be derived from any of those. And they can be uh, equal to the number n. And you would start with zero. Right. So for this one, you can only have zero. N equals one, you can only have zero because there's only one. It starts with zero. This one you can have zero and one because there are two of them. This one you can have zero, one, two. This one you can have zero, one, two, three. Okay. And we get those letters because when we start writing out the configuration, if we had only numbers, it would get confusing. So this is an S orbital. This is a P, that's a D, and that's an F. Okay. Now, from within each one of these, the magnetic quantum number can be starting with the L number. You go as far negative as you can and then move positive one at a time. So let's say two. Two then would be negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, plus two. Okay, and then spin is either plus one half or minus one half inside each one of these m sub l's. Right, so they're they're uh, nested. All right, so now we can answer the question: For two s, how many electrons maximum can a two s have? Well, let's see if we go from two to here, to here you can only have just the one. So you can have two electrons in here and here and here and here. So 2s is just two electrons. That's it. How about 2p? Okay, 2p means you can go here and you can have um, just that in that P, you can have 
minus one, zero, plus one. So there's one, two, three, and each one of those can have two. Right? So that's six. 2p can have six electrons. Right? Uh, 3s. 3s is the same as 2s. 3 can have a zero here. That's it. And it can only have a zero here. So there's only two electrons available. And uh, 3d. 3d. So if we go 3 to D, then we can have one, two, three, four, five of these subshells, and two each means 10. Okay, that's how you figure it out. Now, what if we were to say, uh, how many electrons can be accommodated in N equals three? If n equals three, and we're not specifying anything else, three can have this one, this one, this one, right? So this one can have two, uh, a p can have six, and a two can have 10. So three can have 18 total. Okay, just thought I'd mention that. Okay, so let's write the electronic configuration for these elements. Got to make some room. Okay. <clears throat> First, carbon. All right. So we have to follow Hun's rule. In other words, you got to fill them in order of increasing energy. And in the beginning, that's easy. But as the atom gets bigger and has more electrons to go into orbitals, then you get some reversals. Now, how do we figure that out? Well, I think I showed you, and I know it's in the uh, uh, PowerPoints. You use the diagonal. So you have these possible n numbers. I'm just going to go to five n equals that, and then you can have only s for one. You can have s or p for two. You can have s, p, d for three, s, p, d, f, and s, p, d, f, actually g. But how do you fill them? All right, so you can do, let's see, this is one, two, three, four, five. Let's do it that way. And this is a two, this is a three, three, four, 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 five, 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 and five. And you draw a diagonal. You fill them this direction. There, 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 there there, there, okay? So that means you get 1s, next you do 2s, next you do 2p, next you do 3s, next you do 3p, and then 4s before you come back to 3d. And then you go to 4p, and then you go to 5s, and then you would go back to 4d, 5p, 4f, 5d. Well, actually, no, you go down to 6s here, and then you go back up to 4f. 
I left out the six S. There you go. <clears throat> okay. So that's the order you would film, but you don't need all of those for every atom. That's just the order. So for carbon, you only need room enough for six electrons, right? You would only need two for this one, two for that one, and two for this one. So carbon would just be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. That's it. Let's take a bigger one. How about uh, sodium? Which has 11 electrons. So here we have, and you fill them up in order, 11, two, four, six is 11, one left over for S. Okay, let's take a bigger one. How about uh, argon? Argon is 18, right? So two, four, 10, 12, 18. So argon goes out to there, okay? Now let's take a really big one. Uh, let's see, I don't see one here. I'll just pick one. How about, um, antimony or is that too big that's too big how about selenium 34 okay so 2 4 10 18 20 uh, d is 10 that's 30 and then we have four here, right? So we don't need the five S. That's selenium. Now there's a shorthand way to do this. Notice that when you go to the end of the period, you had a noble gas. And a noble gas is complete out to a P orbital here, P here, P here, P there. So what you can do is combine for this one, combine all the P's, that's an incomplete P. So we have to back up until we get here. So what's the nearest noble gas for that one? Well, let's see, two, 10, 18. 18, what we just did was argon. So you can do argon And then selenium is just past that. 4s2, 3d10, 4p4. That's another shorthand. And what it does is it allows us to focus on what we call valence electrons, those that are actually involved in chemical reactions. Okay, uh, let's see. All right, and there's one th other thing about the periodic table I wanted to show you. Uh, before I do that, let me look at uh, let me look at the other possible questions and see if one is going to fit anyway. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's do 97. Okay. <clears throat> 97. Determine the following for the highlighted elements in the given periodic table. All right. So we got those four highlighted and we're going to answer questions based on those four. All right. So we have the outline, but we're not told what the element is. So you got to be able to look and see. You may not even need to know the element. Okay, so let's just carry on. Uh, A, is the element highlighted in red 
in the S area, the P area, or the P area of the periodic table, okay? What do they mean by S or P area? The areas of the periodic table are there because the highest level, energy level orbit being filled is either S for these two, P for those six, D for the transition elements, or F for the inner transition elements. Right? So you know the, um, the L number or the letter assigned to the L number is being filled in those areas. And that can help you write the electronic configuration faster. But first we're gonna answer these questions. So the red one is in the S area. The S orbitals are being filled here. And that's why there are only two columns because S is only hold two electrons, right? So there's S1 and there's S2. Uh, let's see. B, is the element highlighted in green in the D area or the P area? All transition elements are filling D orbitals. So it's in the D area. Is the element highlighted in yellow a P2 or a P4 element? Okay, now they're getting a little trickier. This is the P area, but how many electrons are in the P orbital in its outermost shell? Well, you go from the left, right here where the P starts. I don't know if you can see that wiggle. P1, P2, P3, P4. So it's a P4 element. And lastly, the element highlighted in blue, a D2 or an S2. Well, it's in the S area and it's in the second column, so it's an S2. Now, <clears throat> Uh, let's pick, let's see, uh, I wanted to pick an element and do the electronic configuration using the periodic table. But before we do, I'm gonna to have to share the table again. So let's get 101 out of the way. Determine the following for the highlighted elements. Right? How many of the highlighted elements are representative? Right? So you just need to find the ones that are in the first two or the last six. Right? So one, two, three, four, five. There are five elements that are representative elements. How many of the highlighted elements are noble gases? Only one, just that one. How many of the elements are non-metallic representative elements? Well, this one and this one are non-metals. They're to the right of that diagonal that runs right down here. See, the temptation is to say this one also, but that's a metal. It's below that zigzag line. Uh, D, how many of the highlighted elements are metals? Right, so we just say uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, don't forget seven, down here in the actinides. Actually, that's uh, uranium. Okay, so now let me share the periodic table and let's draw the configuration from the periodic table. Uh, okay, so I need to stop share and share the periodic table here. All right. So uh, I'm going to use an annotation here. It's not the best idea, but um, let's start off with a circle. Okay. Let's pick an element on the periodic table and write its electronic configuration. How about how about uh, silicon right here? Let's do silicon. Okay, 
What's its atomic number? Because that's how many electrons it will have also. 14. Okay. So <clears throat> if we follow along and we add electrons into the next highest position, energy-wise, as you go, if you start with hydrogen and keep going, hydrogen is a 1s, helium is a is a 1s1, helium is a 1s2. So you fill those two. They're done. You go back to the next period. Okay, now we're in the two, principle number two, two, S2, we could go these two, 2s2. Two, two. That takes you to beryllium. Then you jump over to the P section. And you're still in two. So this is 2P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2P6. Okay. Then you have to double back. Now you're in the 3S section. 3S1. 3s2 for magnesium. Okay, then you skip over because there's nothing in between. Now we're in the 3p area. 3p1, 3p2. That's it. That's silicon. Let's count. 2, 4, 10, 12, 14. Okay, that was an easy one. Now I'm going to do a hard one. <clears throat> um, let's say, well, let's move, let's move down to geranium. No, arsenic. Let's do arsenic, 33. Okay. Now, we've already gotten silicon up to 3P2. So we just need 3P3, 4, 5, 6. Right, so we do 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6. Right, we're down to argon. And then we come back to 4S. <coughs> 4S1, 4S2. do better than that. Okay, 4s2. Now we're getting into the D section. But on the fourth period, when you're filling D orbitals, you're not filling four Ds, you're filling three Ds. You have to back up one. So scandium starts with 3d1 and goes all the way down to zinc, 3d10. That's why you have 10 elements there, right? D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 3D10 gets you to zinc. 3D10. Now we're back into the P's. Okay, we go back to the fourth period for the P's. Right, so we went to 3D's for a while. Now we're back to 4P. So 4P1 for gallium, 4P2 germanium, 4P3 for arsenic. Okay. That's how you use the periodic table to fill out electronic configurations. Um, now, if we were to get down here into the F region, we would have to go along here like this and do 3D1 and then go down to uh, 6. 6s would be then 5d1 and then you would go to 4f1 4f2 4f3 4f4 on across the problem with uh this region down in here and, and in fact it happens up here too <clears throat> is that the based on the quantum mechanics and the calculations that tell you what the energy levels are Sometimes you get electron switching in order to uh, fill orbitals. Uh, for instance, zinc would be 3D10, right? But copper, 
Copper is not, uh, excuse me. Yeah, copper is not uh, 3D9. You would expect copper to have uh, 4S2 3D9. But as it turns out, the D orbitals are much happier if they're complete. If you're very close to completion, like you only need one electron, then the energy level of the, of the 4S is higher than it is for Ds. So what copper does is it goes back to 4S1, 3D10. So copper is a 3D10 also just like zinc, and it steals an electron from the 4s orbital. Now, I'm not going to throw that one at you, because those types of um, variations are, are reserved for general chemistry. <clears throat> for this course, I just wanted to tell you that that does happen. It even happens down here with uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for iron. Uh, no, excuse me, for uh, chromium. Chromium is just short of being half filled. Like manganese is, is uh, 3D5. Chromium is also 3D5, but it steals an electron from the 4S orbital to do it. Okay, so there it is. I think, let me take another look at those problems but I think we're probably done for our review. And I've done pretty much what I thought I would do. I went an hour over. So let me stop this share here and take a look at, um, I'll look at my hard copy so I don't have to reshare it. Yeah, that does it. That's chapter one, two, and three. So between now and uh, next Friday, you've got time to uh, finish off, you know, get this stuff well in mind. <clears throat> and be sure and, and uh, uh, be sure that your lockdown browser is loaded on your computer and it works. That's why that practice test is there. So do the practice test and be sure that all your equipment is working correctly. You can get in, do the test, and get out. Um, then when you start the exam, you should not have to worry about equipment failures. Of course, now, uh, as a last word, if you get in the middle of an exam and the power fails, right, in this type of weather, it could, or if your internet goes out, right? Then what you need to do is contact me and I'll reset the exam and you'll have to start all over again. So it might be well, I, one other thing that I've enabled in that browser is the ability for you to print the screen. Right? So as you go, and all of the questions are there at once. You just scroll down through them. So as you go, if you if you scroll to where you're you're moving a whole bank of answers into uh, out of the screen, then before you do that, you may want to print that screen and hold it. Because if the power goes out, then you'll have those answers and you won't have to go back and do them again. Um, but you've got my cell phone, you can text me. Like if you're in the middle of, a, you only have a certain time slot that you can do your exam and something goes wrong, then you wanna get back into it as soon as possible. And of course, when you start it over, the timer starts over again also. So there it is. And between now and then, um, I'm good. And uh, the my schedule also has office hours listed. Right. If you see it, feel the need for office hours, then they're on my schedule. Uh, what you need to do is use my my personal ID, and that's in the syllabus. I think maybe also the syllabus has a uh, 
Let me check this. Does it have a password that you have to input to gain access to the uh, to the exam? Let me look. Let me look. Password. Mm. Okay. There's my instructor office hours with my personal ID. So you just need to go into Zoom outside, not not from within Blackboard, but open your Zoom client on your uh, desktop or your phone for that matter, and use that ID to connect if you need to catch me in office hours. I'm looking for uh, a passcode. Maybe it'll be over here. Give me a second. Well, there's nobody there, so you can skip in the recording to if I, when it's, once I finally find it. Uh, yes. Okay. So the password uh, to open the exam, the password is the same as the CRN or the course reference number that goes with this course, which is 509. But it's also in the syllabus. Okay, that's all the damage I can do today. So I'm gonna close it off and uh, start processing the recording.